Welcome to your weekly program, Bilahdan, the show that brings the other side of Arab American to your living room. Continue with our series about uh, what uh, Muslim Americans do uh, post 9-11 and, you know, talking about the hostile environment that Muslim Americans are living these days and then people talking about Islamo-fascists and, and the campaign trail and the Muslims, nobody speaks uh, of their fears and racial profiling and uh, uh, and, and, and presidential election and all that to become politically homeless. We uh, we talked about the two camp, you know, the people who wants to bring uh, domesticize Islam and kind of mold it to fit the American life and the secular life, and the other one wants to do away with uh, uh, you know uh, Islamic tradition or Islamic uh, uh, beliefs and uh, calling for the Muslims to really uh, to. Uh, to stand uh, uh, to stand up to their own tradition and try to look at uh, American constitutions and especially Jefferson's and uh, look at Jefferson's uh, as a model of solving that conflict between Islam and the West or Islam and America, as he put it. Uh, we have an interview uh, that we uh, that we conducted with Dr. Uh, uh, you know Anwar Majidi, and he is a Moroccan American uh, professor of uh, English literature, and he was here in the Twin City at the University of St. Thomas, and I, I was fortunate enough to have an interview with them, and uh, he, he basically saying you know forget about this Sharia and Quran, forget about uh, uh, the Prophet, or whatever, not necessarily in this war, but we should. <laughs> Uh, uh, look at Jefferson and the Constitution for a solution to solve this conflict between uh, Islam and uh, and the West. Uh, so he's he's really turning uh, uh, America to another ide ideology and to another uh, religion. And uh, he is has a book called The Call of Heretics and uh, and uh, asking people to stand out and bec and, and question their own traditions. Uh, in, in, in Islamic world and also in American world. So we'll have this interview with you and we'll see you next week. Salaam alaikum and God bless you all. Uh, one of the most uh, inflammatory issues of the 21st century is the clash, so called clash of civiliz uh, civilization, clash of stupidity or clash of fanatism or clash of fundamentalism. And that's the clash between Americanism or American as uh, hegemony and the Islamic uh, fanatic. and. Uh, uh, we have a very special guest today who is, is really wrote uh, uh, and invested uh, a lot of energy and a lot of intellectual uh, juice in, in that topic. Uh, we have Dr. Uh, Anwar Majid. Uh, he came to U.S. as a student from Morocco 20 years ago, maybe a little bit more than that. He went on to write numerous articles and novels and two acclaimed books about Islam. Islamic idea and culture, and he, he became the founding chair of the Department of English at the University of New England, where he also taught. He is visiting the University of St. Thomas, so we took this chance to invite him here and talk about uh, this topic. Welcome to Bilahdan. It was very nice of you to come, and, and I know you're very busy, but uh, this is very interesting uh, take on, uh, and, and, and especially after 9-11 when, you know, the uh, you know, you know, access of evil and the language, the medieval language that came out of the Bush, uh, the uh, Cheney uh, uh, <coughs> campaign, uh, which she really, as a Muslim myself, sitting here living in this country for almost thirty years now, uh, I listen to this uh, language, and I, it, it seems like the same language I, I was listening to back home from this fanatic, you know, from you know, good and evil and infidels and all that. So your take on, uh, you know, what you're saying here is in your book, uh, A Call for Heresy, is you really, no matter what it's been said, we need to challenge those ideas and you need to really check it out. And, uh, you know, we, even American themselves with all this free uh, democracy and all the things uh, that, that they them, pride themselves with it, uh, that's not enough. That, that, that also need to be changed, uh, I mean, challenged. Tell us a little bit about the analogy between, uh, you know, 
corporate fanatic or uh, economic fanatics, as he called them, and uh, Islamic fanatics or Islamic uh, uh, jihadist. Well, no, thank you for asking that question, and uh, honored to be with you in the oh, show. <laughs> honor, though. And uh, I, you know, for, for, let's take it up. The analogy is, and it's an interesting word that you mentioned, analogy, because if you look now at both societies, the Islamic world, for example, and the United States, and let's see, you know, they're both suffering in different ways. And I would say that in the United States, the number one issue that is inflicting a tremendous amount of hardship and suffering on, on the American people would have to be related to what's happening at the economic level. Uh, I mean, we've seen the issue of the housing bubble that, uh, and the, the subprime scandal, if you want. Katrina. And, uh, in Katrina. Well, the, there's a no number of issues, the health care issue, Americans seem to be unable to break away from an economic model that has that is cons constantly and increasingly inflicting a, a good deal of suffering on them, and that is and 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 that and it's also repressing in some ways the uh, the ability uh, to think creatively and differently. So, in the case of the United States, uh, you're right to mention that the orthodoxy, uh, the uh, tyrannical powers in the United States are more closely associated with the economic system, and namely, you know, the uh, the corporate orthodoxy or the corporate model. In the in the case of the Islamic world, even though Muslims also have a lot of economic problems and they suffer in the same from the same uh, deficiencies of globalization, uh, on, but more importantly for them is that Muslims have not been able to break away, to liberate themselves intellectually from religious orthodoxies that are being constantly maintained and uh, and uh, hammered uh, on them by 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 a co the collusion of uh, political establishments and very traditional uh, backward-looking religious institutions. Yeah, so uh, you know, it's interesting because. Uh, the criticism to the economic uh, model or the economic uh, reality or orthodox or fanatic, this is what the free market capitalists pride themselves, that they solve the material uh, problem for a majority of people. And, uh, and I've always thought, uh, you know, the difference between our part of the world and our part, we all uh, controlled by generals. Here we have General Motors, General Electric, General whatever, uh, General Electronic, and General whatever. Yes. And we have General Saddam, General Mubarak, General. They all so yeah. they all general control. So the, the the economic power controlling the political system here, mm -hmm. but here, other there it's the other way around. Yes. The political power controlling the economics. That's true, and and it's the interesting way. The interesting thing about both models. systems or models, the ones you're talking about, is that the uh, they are both purported to solve, you know, the perennial human problems. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, you know economic, let's say the corporate model you're talking about in the United States, it's, it, it, we are supposed to believe that that's a solution, uh, and, and, that, and that's a solution to human, uh, to human uh, Misery, for example, mm -hmm. or, or the lack of freedom, mm -hmm. and in the case of the in the case of the Islamic world, and you know, our religion is supposed to be the answer to what is to what we are. Lacking. And they say the Islamic is uh, a is, is a solution. Yeah. So capitalism or, or corporate economics is a solution in the United States. Islam is a solution in in the Islam in, in the Islamic world. But don't you think that the, the economic uh, solution that the free market capitalism came up with? is backed by intellectual stagnation too because you cannot just have an economic system without an intellectual like yeah. the theory of uh, invisible hand i mean they have the invisible i've been looking for this invisible hand for 30 years i've never seen the math we always been the you know uh, 900 billion dollars on pornography and i don't know what that invisible hand has something to do with this <laughs> and uh, and you have somebody have phd all his work yeah. is to see if the lifesaver uh, that the child is turned it uh, upside down or he put his fung tongue in and so it's a wasted re intellectual resource mm -hmm. for just uh, for consu consumptions uh, yes. of uh, consumer like artificial profit and artificial needs and all that that the economic system is providing us in the same token over there you know you have a system 
uh, of stagnation based on you know as you you say there is a stagnation of their head and thinking and uh, there is no dissent which create the, the, the economic uh, reality that they have that so that both are connected in a way aren't right. they? And, and it's very interesting that you mentioned the invisible hand by the way that phrase is mentioned only three times in the Adam entire Smith. body of work of Adam Smith and mentioned it's usually taken out casually of is, it, is it naturally like it's a, a casual it's description or really a core it's related to astronomy but but anyway it's a, it's that's that requires another extensive another show <laughs> Okay, we, we were talking about uh, the invisible hand that Adam Smith uh, is providing us, mm -hmm. and you're talking about there is a stagnation also. There is no heresy there because nobody questioned the invisible hand. And in fact, it was, you know, he did not solve the poverty. Even with all, you know, the, in the last hundred years, productivity went up a thousand times, yes. and we still have problems. Yes. And the same talk in, in, in the Islamic world, mm -hmm. nobody uh, questioned the invisible hand, which in, uh, presumably is God. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, nobody questioned that because it's Islam is a hell. Mm -hmm. So, in, in the same, there is both have a stagnation as far as questioning the power that's running the show. That's right. And the stagnation uh, is a result. It's not necessarily Adam Smith's fault or, do, of, uh, or doing. But in fact, how people appropriated Adam Smith and completely misused him in a way that he never intended. For the example, the notion of the invisible hand, which is mentioned, which is very often mentioned as a, as a justification for corporate excess or, or the uh, freedom of the markets, Actually, Adam Smith had a lot more to say about the economic system than than the, than, than the invisible hand, than, than just merely mentioning the invisible hand. For example, he was for higher wages. Uh, he thought they were indispensable for prosperity of a nation. He was against corporate control in so many cases, and he was a big sympathizer with the French Revolution, or, or with his contemporary, with his peers in France, like uh, 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 other economists who who are who are, who are equally dedicated to the notion. If he was actually, the one thing that he was against is the state's intervention in controlling agricultural uh, uh, products, particularly uh, corn. The issue, the big issue, because that led to starvation. And you know, Condorcet, and efficiency also. Yeah, Condorcet was the big proponent that in, of that in France. He also talked about uh, free trade. Uh, you know, he was against state intervention because the state, you know, caused more problems and in fact led that those interventions led to starvation mm -hmm. but it was only one instance in which they were against state intervention in the economy but for the most part they were they, they wanted the state to intervene to create to balance the economy to make sure that people are getting higher wages and to make to make sure that there was no corporate control over the economy but none of this is now mentioned uh, in the dominant economic discourse. The culture yeah. of uh, free market, Yes. if you come and question this, it, it seems like if you go and uh, question hadith or a prophet saying. Yes. But wh what I'm saying is very interesting because when I watch Al Jazeera, when I watch the other channel, there's, there is a huge debate in the Muslim world, in a very serious matter. I don't know how You're massive right. in the street and the culture itself, but you get people talk about serious questioning that facing Islam and the Shia and Sunni questions and uh, you know what Islam think of suicide mm -hmm. and what Islam think of violence and you hear all this about what the text says but here nobody's question why the 9-11 people uh, you know that hijacker mm -hmm. did it why this is happening nobody's question why uh, you know the free market uh, did not deliver to a lot of millions of people who are under poverty and African America still, uh, you know, living, uh, you know, nothing really a major uh, change in happening. And but I, I, are we are we are we comparing that stagnation in a, in, a, in a quantitative way, or uh, is there a hope in the Islamic world that that you can see it for your traveling now, where people start really raising those questions uh, and, and saying, you know. We really in the dead end here. We need to find a, a different look at Islam. That's true. The, when, whenever orthodoxy is so powerful and so dominant, people over time use the tools or the capacity to question it, and it becomes like a deity, like a god. That's why it is not. That's why the key word to remember is always orthodoxies, not necessarily religion. You know, in one in one country, in one society, in one in one place, the orthodoxy could be religious, of a religious nature. But in another society, it could be of an economic nature, even though there's a lot of overlap and I, a I lot see. of things uh -huh. in common. So 
it makes better sense for me to, if I'm comparing the stagnation in two societies, one in the West and one in the Middle East and so on and so forth, is to look at the forces that make each society, uh, uh, which undermine each, each society individually. So in the case of Islam, in the case of Muslim societies, clearly we haven't been able to break away from the, uh, you know, the traditions of the past and we haven't been able to think creatively about the future because of the incredible hegemony of the religious forces on and uh, uh, on the social fabric in the United States, uh, one can have a plurality of religious beliefs, but the one sacred element in the United States is the economy. Any time, any attempt to deviate from the mainstream economic system, which is upheld by the corporate powers, you know, puts you in the place of a heretic in religious societies. Look at the bit about uh, universal health care. Yes. My goodness, it's like an evil concept which is, is applied in most of industrial nation, you know, yes. in Europe and Canada, but they debate it here as like a social conspiracy against uh, Americana right. that we're going to have a social, uh, you know. Uh, but, uh, you know, we <coughs> when we, when we uh, you know, we talk about, uh, you know, in the last, maybe it's not just even uh, post 9-11, Islam under uh, the, the microscope yes. and, 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 and is scrutinized and sieged mm -hmm. by uh, coming and try to answer questions that presented by modern life and modernity. And I don't see that, like uh, now we hear on an, uh, an, uh, an election trail Islamo-fascism. Mm -hmm. A term it is terrifying me. Mm. I've never heard this term before, yes. and, and even you know, technically and academically and socially and morally mm. wrong. Yes. And it's been accepted and circulated through the media, mm. and nobody's questioned that. Yes. And what what I'm saying is, Islam as a religion is the only religion being questioned to answer. What do you think of homosexuality? Why do you marry four? What are you? We don't ask, ask Judaism and uh, Christianity the same questions. Mm -hmm. And what, if you don't like Islam, try Christianity mm -hmm. and see what happens. So what, what is the world would, would, would be look like without Islam? Mm -hmm. It's a question that, with that, that it would have to be invented. I mean, actually, a lot of modern Islam was the result of modern forces in play. You know, yeah. I mean, the, the, uh, the Taliban and... It was communism, uh, now it's Taliban, whatever. Uh, all these forces were the result of modern practices. You know, they didn't exist. Afghanistan, historically, and so was Pakistan. Other were no, more Sufi than they were Wahhabi yeah. fundamentalists. Uh -huh. So the big question to ask, how did the societies become more uh, adopted a Wahhabi type of ideology? And where has, where has Sufism gone in these societies? And there, there are explanations for this. There are explanations for this, and there are more. You know, w one could find explanations. You don't have to go back way back into history to find an explanation. If you went back three decades, you would find plenty of reasons why these societies have trans changed from gentle Sufi folk into like um, you know uh, sword waving, yeah. uh, wish fun 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 fundamentalist. So. There are historical forces that can explain what happened to the societies, and there's a reason for that. Uh, and so Islam, like an, a belief system, a religion, or is always can always be changed by historical circumstances to look differently at, 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 dif at different historical times. So, but the combination of Islam and fascism, uh, the implication here is that Islam is not an open system. Uh, it is. It persecutes those who do not adhere to its tenets, and uh, therefore it has a tendency to tyranny. And and hence they use the word fascism to go. Well, with I can it. understand Muslims fascist, yes. not Islamic. I know Islamic culture, Islamic, yes. but Islamic. Fa do we have the combination of terms? Doesn't work. I mean, you could say every every ideology has a tendency towards fascism in the sense that. That it can, it tolerates. It doesn't tolerate dissent. It doesn't tolerate difference, and so on. But, uh, but you cannot have. You cannot say Christian fascism, or you cannot say cap, you know, capitalism fascism, because ca any ism in itself, you it know, is implies a, a form of so it's redundant in a way. Rigid ideological boundaries. Uh, so, uh, yes, I mean, ideologies. Muslims can be fascist. Ideologies have a tendency to be. In 
closed systems only if people allow them to be closed systems. People else can open them up again and make of them very elastic, flexible so ways of thinking. I, I mean, uh, I, I look at a uh, compare like uh, uh, the, the, the economic uh, orthodox. Mm -hmm. When you go and invade another country, and almost a million people killed one way or another because you want to spread democracy. Mm. Sacra fundamentalism, it, it's more dangerous than religious fundamentalism, in my opinion, mm -hmm. because when you look at the Islamic world, there is no Islamic country mm -hmm. that is run by Islamic short of Iran, mm -hmm. and I don't think Saudi Arabia is Islamic country. It's mm -hmm. just run by a family, Saudi. Mm -hmm. That's why they call it Saudis, yes. Saudi Arabia. They don't yes. call it Islamic Arabia, yes. right? Otherwise, every Muslim should go there like, uh, like uh, Israel. Yes. Israel is the most fundamentalist religious state mm -hmm. because it's based on being Jewish. Yes. But nobody talks about Jude, uh, 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 Jewish fundamentalism or Jewish fascism. They have the most powerful uh, army in the area. Mm. What, what does Bin Laden has? What does uh, Saudi have? They're all uh, almost corrupt regimes. Mm -hmm. What the Muslim world are run by corrupt regimes. Mm -hmm. So the fundamentalism of Muslims is a reaction to that power that imposes on them. Mm. And it is very defensive and very uh, reactionary, not because Islam itself is reactionary or whatever, but because, as you said, the history and the conditions uh, create the uh, attitude and condition of most Muslims that are very reactionary to anything comes from the West to whatever, any new idea, not because of their being, you know, being is uh, Muslims or Islamic, but because of the history of the power that imposed on them uh, you know, from uh, those undemocratic, despotic uh, regimes. But but there are also limits to that because you know how long can we can Muslims go, keep going saying that we, it's not our fault. It's because we are in this crisis because the others are colonizing us or occupying us. We know that the Muslims have been saying this since Napoleon came to Egypt. So it's been more well, than two... Colonized by, by their own people now. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Not by the foreigners. Yes. It's been more than two centuries that, that the Arabs and the Muslims are, are blaming, let's say, the West, so to speak, for their shortcomings. Well, there comes a time when you have to both resist any attempt at domination from the other, from the outside, but also to critically examine your own traditions. Otherwise, if you don't critically examine your own traditions, you won't have the right tools to resist the oppression coming from outside. So in other words, we are in a... Yeah. The and like it happened in, uh, in Eastern Europe, it happened in South America, it's even happening in, uh, in Africa. That yes. People start the and question. You cannot resist successfully any attempt at, at domination without changing the way you do things. Because apparently the way Muslims have been doing things for the last, at least for the last two centuries, if not more, of absolutely more than that, uh, it's not working. I mean, in other words, there's something is not working in the intellectual and cultural and even political structure of this society that needs to be changed and, and rethought in order, in order for people to move on to a new place. And that is what is keeping them in this uh, state of paralysis, I would say. And, and, and we'll talk about the Islamic world as if it's one thing. I mean, this is a, a billion and a half, and I'm yes. sure uh, Pakistan's Muslims is different than Algeria and Islamic. So there's a lot of, I mean, I, I was, when I look at the, the Muslims in India, yeah. the only difference is uh, the religion. Mm -hmm. In Pakistan, they were Indians. Yes. So you talk about why India's prosperous and I mean at least the questioning and change and then Pakistan is not and uh, and uh, they have the same history same culture mm -hmm. the only I don't want to blame Islam but yeah. uh, I also when you look at Islam and uh, when you look at uh, the, the history of Islam or Muslims are we monitoring by a secular mother uh, uh, looking at it from a secular mother uh, glasses or measurement you know I know you mentioned sometime when uh, in the Hayes days in Morocco when you grown up you used to debate uh, uh, religion and, uh, you know, with uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, a glass of wine in your hand. Are you telling me <laughs> to have a good debate you have to be drunk? <laughs> well, you know, I have a friend of mine He told me the problem with Islam is it's against alcohol. Exactly. <laughs> I'm know? sorry if you, have, if, you have, if you drink a couple of drinks, you that know. fundamentalism is going to just, and instead of dropping bombs, drop Budweiser's. <laughs> yes. I think that will do. Well, how about dropping poetry, you know? <laughs> Something. <laughs> it's, it's, but what I'm saying is, are we looking at this modern symbolism? Yes. If you don't look like uh, 
Nike and uh, iPod, you are backward. Yeah, well, that commercialism has not, I mean, this commercial culture afflicts everybody. It, it's yeah. bad for Americans, it's bad for Muslims, it's bad, for, I mean, for every society that, because it's, the effects of it are not good no. in the long term. But I think, you know, uh, since you mentioned wine, let me give you a very interesting uh, thing that's happening right now in the, Islamic, in the Islamic world. I mean, last year in Morocco, in November, I think, if I'm not mistaken, maybe October, you know, very recently, you know, they, for the first time since colonialism, you know, the winemakers of Morocco you know, celebrated the first festival of the vine. And publicly. Publicly. And, it, and, and, and the, one of the best wine producing regions in, country, in, the, in the country is in Meknes, which also happens to be the stronghold of the Islamist political party. And there so was he's producing for, uh, not for Muslims? No, wait. I mean, it is a very serious production, a huge amount. It even got the designation of Chateau from the French connoisseurs. And lo and behold, uh, a good amount, I think if I remember correctly, 80% of the consumption of this wine is, hap is local. It's in Morocco by Moroccans. Only a portion, a tiny little portion of that is I exported see. overseas. There's also a growing wine industry in Egypt and other uh -huh. parts of the, uh -huh. and uh, after a long well, absence. Well, you know, that's a thing. But, but that's mostly for the export. So here we are in, an, in the Islamic world, in an Islamic society, you know, where fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism and obscuritism is on the rise, but at the same time, the, the, modern, uh, the, the wine industry, the wine culture is also growing at the same rate. Uh, at the same rate. Another interesting fact, which I cannot tire of mentioning, last year Google pub, you know, declared what is, the number one, uh, what is the number one word Moroccans put in their search engines when they go to Google. It's sex. Morac the number one word that Moroccans, when they go on the internet, they put in the search engine Just of goodness. Google is sex. Moroccans are looking for sex mm -hmm. and was something related to sex. So here we are, a conservative society, a society where the powers of conservatism and tradition are trying to push well, it in one direction. Some, yeah, someone might say this is not Islamic. I mean, this is not Islamic tradition to have a free fall uh, sexual uh, interviews. Yeah. But the, on that note, this is the wonderful note, and I know. Uh, you are here and uh, for a short time, and, and I think we're going to end up with this. We appreciate your coming here. But before we go, I want to autograph this from you, so I'll ch cherish it. Might not read it, but I'm going to have your uh, <laughs> autograph. <laughs> okay. I might sell it. Okay. <laughs> okay.